Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Rewind and Replay. I'm Matan. I'm Adriana. And I'm Caitlin. And today we're going to be talking about reboots and sequels. Not ones that exist, but ones we wish did. Each of us is bringing one reboot and one sequel. We're going to go over them together. We're going to do all, you know, all three reboots and then all three sequels. And the three of us are going to vote on whose we think is the best, who did the best pitch. So to start off, we're having Adriana. Uh, do, yeah, just go for it. Take it away. Yeah. yeah, so I'm very enthused by the idea of this reboot. I spent a long time trying to think, like, what game would I want redone? I think some of the impulse, you know, was like thinking, oh, I should pick like, an older game. Um, but I was doing some research um, and I stumbled upon this NPR article about Stardew Valley. Um, have you guys played Stardew at all? I'm familiar with it. I've not played it. Yeah, I am familiar. I've, I've dabbled. I don't own it. I've played other people's. You both suck. Um, it's, it's a great game. So for those of you, yeah, so for those of you listening, if you haven't played Sturdy Valley, um, the premise of the game is basically that you've inherited your grandfather's old farm in a place called Sturdy Valley, like a very rural town. Um, you're armed with hand-me-down tools and, you know, a few coins, and you set out just to, like, begin life. So this game itself is actually a lot like a reboot of Harvest Moon, if you guys mm -hmm. have ever played those games. Mm -hmm. Um but it's, you know, it's a reimagination, new technology, uh, now for P it originated as a PC game instead of for the DS or for the Switch. Um, but so I thought, you know, that itself is interesting. What, what would it be like to reboot what is basically a reboot? Um, and so I was reading this NPR article about um, a father and his daughter playing Sturdy Valley, not like on the multiplayer co-op, but just like having their separate experiences. Um, I don't have the article title, but the author is Jason Sheehan. Um, and so his daughter is like 13. And it, what he noticed really is that kind of the experience if you've played Harvest Moon that you get as a child is the world is so uh, different from your own. You have so much freedom. It's something to explore. But playing it as an adult, like these are rules, you know, like min-maxing your harvest and figuring out profit. Like these are all things as an adult you're very familiar with you make money, like these are responsibilities mm -hmm. and such. Um, so it's a very different experience. And that's kind of the beauty of the game, right? Like it's pastoral, you get to just like do whatever the fuck you want. You can plant strawberries and chase fairies, you know? Um, or you can really min-max and try to make the biggest, most awesome industrial farm that you want. Um, there are a lot of ways to play it, which is what people love, right? About like Terraria or Minecraft. It's the same kind of style. Um, although, obviously, those two games are much more open world. Um, and what I would like for a Stardew Valley reboot is, because I think Stardew Valley is perfect the way it is, but I would love to see a version that is more adult-oriented. So in the game, you have a lot of references to the world at large. There's um, the god in the game is called Yoba. Um, there are a ton of different races. So like fantasy style races, can, right? Can so you be different races? No, you cannot. Mm. Would you want that in the reboot? I would love that in the reboot, mm -hmm. uh, depending. So I think my ideal reboot would be kind of like an open world, a more open world kind of game. Um, maybe like God of War like, right? Like not totally open, but like more open. Um, but so the races right now, like that you've seen as the human player are humans, obviously. Uh, dwarves, shadow people. Junimos, uh, fairies, elves, goblins, mer people, and a reference to like tundra dwellers, which I assume were like humans that just live in the Arctic. I have no idea. Hmm. I want to play as the. I want to play as like Bigfoot people. Ooh. Like I would get that they they're the tundra people would be my guess. Mm -hmm. You don't know. Like he, there's no way to know. Um, so the creator of the game, obviously, I mean, maybe he didn't think about the world really and just kind of gave us these things. Um, I have no idea. But we also get references to things like the big city, right? So like I live in the mm. Bay Area, right? So when I think of the city, it's like San Francisco. Um, so they have, you know, like you get these references, you get Zuzu City and there's like a grid ball team. And grid ball is like the sport, like football, I guess. Um, there were references to like movies and video games and like the world's version of D&D. &D. Um, there's also like a war going on that is like barely ever talked about. 
Um, so like it seems far away, it seems like it could be a metaphor for one of the world wars. One of the villagers comes back from the war, um, but you still don't even get much out of him there. Um, there's an item cart in the game where they basically like smuggle items out of the country that they're at war with. Um, so I think there's a lot that Stardew Valley remake could delve into with like a more, I don't want to say narrative experience necessarily because part of the appeal of the game is you can but, kind of just- But more lore out, heavy. But yeah. Sure. Yeah, more lore more heavy. More of the story. It'd be really cool. Do you have right, so like, if, so maybe even thinking- Oh, go, go ahead. Okay, do you have- <laughs> Okay, I was gonna say um, like, um- <sighs> Fuck it. God damn it's it. Delay. It's the delay of Zoom. We don't it's know. It's the delay. <laughs> Adriana, you go for it. I was going to say something like Breath of the Wild-ish. Okay. I'd love to see something like that. So how do you do farming in a Breath of the Wild-ish game? Um, you do farming the, the same way you do like cooking and stuff. It's okay. So most like farming simulator kind of games have you like highlight over the title with like over the tile with like your weapon so like you can see what you're farming. Yeah. Um, a, a good example of this is a recent game, uh, Ooblets, and it's very much got like the 3D nature of something like Zelda. The graphics are still different. Um, they're more stylized and pixelized, um, but it's still a, a bigger advancement than like the flat 2D world that a lot of these games tend to do. Um, it's so like a mix between those two. Mm -hmm. I, okay. I would also love to see something kind of like divinity-esque, right? Where you can pick these different races and you start, like it informs like your background and stuff. Cool. Interesting. Like you get like a different plot line. Yeah. Have you thought about any plot line, storyline that you would want to see in this? Or do you just want it to be like less narrative, more just do whatever? Um, I don't know. I would love, because again, like the heart of the game is farming. Um, mm -hmm. It's very much like the American ideal, like start from nothing, work your way up, right. um, which is like fake, right? It's not like real. Right. And that's why we play it in a video game, um, because it's more accessible that way. Um, and it's very rewarding. Um, so I'd love to see like being a farmer literally in the middle of the war. Mm. Um, I think that could be interesting. Um, I think it'd be interesting being a farmer who has to like, who's like near the city and like has to go there to sell his goods. Um, okay. It's like one of the mechanics that happens a lot with these games is just like the shipping box idea. So like you put it in the box and someone in the town brings it to the city and sells it for you. Um, which oh. I think is kind of like a cop out. Like you, I'd love to go to the city and sell my goods. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. You have to, you, you play the farmer's market. I'm kind of into that. I like that. I like it. I would love to play the farmer's market. Um, yeah, I mean, I would also love to see like kind of like a greenhouse setting, right? Like you're mm. part of like an industry and they have mm -hmm. you do a greenhouse instead of like an actual farm. Um, I don't know. There's, a, there's, I think, a lot to like explore. Is it still top down, mostly 2D? Um, I want to say yes. Okay. Yeah, I want to say it's it's mostly 2D. I would I really have to like show you guys Ooblets. Um, I'm obsessed with that game. It's very much top down third person, um, but it's still like 3D graphics mostly. Uh, I watch I watched or, a little bit you know, of Ooblets. Good balance. It's a really yeah. It's, I think it's a good balance. It's a good style that work that would work for the game. My my revamp. Um, yeah. Nice. I, I'm 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 intrigued. I think yeah. that was a good first presentation. Yeah, I mean, I know some people's issue with Stardew is that it's a little too sandboxy. Too sandboxy. Okay. Right, like it's like if you're an adult gamer, we're used to playing these games with like really dark narratives or like That's narrative true. focused things, right? It's it's very different. Um, but like as a kid, you just want to like play Minecraft or Roblox right. and like I, build cool shit. I think um, I think adult games generally are narrative heavily heavy on the narrative or heavy on the competition and Stardew mm -hmm. is neither of those. Stardew is neither of those. Um, Stardew can be really narrative depending how you play it. There's a lot to learn about the characters when you go through like their heart events or like their friendship mm -hmm. events. And like I was saying, like I know this much about the world because that all gets 
uh, shown to you through dialogue, through dialogue with the characters. Right. That's how you learn about these little world cool. bits. Um, but I mean, even still, the narrative is what you make of it. Like you don't have to get married. All you have to do is like visit grandpa's ghost. That's like it. <laughs> Um, and like there are other things you can do. You can like 100% the lines, you can get married, you can have kids, you can do whatever. Um, yeah. Great. Well, yeah, I think you did a very solid job there. Um, I'm going next. And my reboot is, this is, a, this is a weird one. I don't think a lot of people are going to see this coming. And this is PlayStation All-Stars Battle Royale. Yes, the Sony ripoff of Super Smash Bros. that's flopped and no one remembers. Yeah, this is definitely a weird one. Uh, you're going to um, have to win me over. Um, I think I, you picked two weird ones, actually. I, I did. In my opinion. And see, like, I thought, here. here's the thing. I, I'll get let the audience in a little behind the scenes info. So I picked, I had a bunch of ideas for reboot and for sequel. And I realized, like, PlayStation All-Stars was the one I cared about the most for reboot. And I was going to do a sequel to Super Smash Bros. Melee, not Brawl, a direct sequel to Melee, but I realized like two fighters, especially one that's a ripoff of the other, is not a really good presentation. But we'll get to my sequel later. So PlayStation All-Stars Battle Royale I, it was a game I was really excited about as a kid. I, had a, I got a PS3 kind of late in the life cycle, and I was really into Smash, still am. And so I was really excited to see those two merging. And the game just kind of kind of sucked. Like it took kind of the worst, it like totally misunderstood what makes Smash interesting and unique. Um, and kind of took, it kind of to me took the worst of, of traditional fighters and the worst of Smash. Like Smash, what makes Super Smash Bros. one thing that makes it great to me is like, it's not about getting rid of a health bar. It's about knocking people off the screen, off the stage, um, which is unique. Nobody, nobody else had done that. Um, and so, but like the more hits you take, the further you fly. So like you can be living, like you can die at 50% and you can die at 200%. What changes that is your skill and the skill of your opponent. Um, but this game didn't have that percentage system. It didn't have you knocking people off the stage really. It's more just you hit people to build a meter and then you use that meter to kill them. And you have, that's the only way you can kill them. I don't know. I, didn't I mean, really that work. sounds very typical fighter game. It yeah, is, but so. but what's weird is that it's only meter can kill people. Hmm. So in fighting games, usually, hmm. you know, you're fighting people, you're knocking down their health bar, and then a meter is just like a better attack or a different attack. But this one's like only meter can kill, which is kind of kind of weird. It didn't work. It's interesting. It didn't work. So for this yeah. game, for my reboot, it's going to be a 2D fighter, a more traditional fighter a la uh, Street Fighter, or yeah. I, I think even closer to the NetherRealm games with less brutality. That's Injustice and Mortal Kombat. Uh, that's who, who makes them. So health bars, consistent knockback, uh, pressing back to block, things like that. Um, I really did like the stage mashups. So often one thing this game did that was really cool is every stage was a mix of two different games. So it would start as one and then turn into the other, um, but in a really cool way. So it started as this cute little pat upon like chibi background and then a Metal Gear would come slice through it. And then like all this gunfighting would be going on. And I thought that that style was really cool. I don't know. Um, uh, so I, I think that, I also like the different levels of super. Like if you had one meter to burn, um, you, could, you would do one attack. If you had two, you would do a different attack. Three, you would do a different attack. Um, and so you could save it and it would be easier to hit or you could be riskier and use it early. And I like that idea. Usually. I, I haven't, usually there's just one super in a fighting game, yeah. and I like there to be multiple. Um, this game had three attack buttons instead of two, uh, and I think that was kind of overwhelming. I know Street Fighter has six, but it's not the same thing. Like, I think sticking to two attack buttons, may, maybe do three. I'm not totally dead set on it, um, but one thing that I think would sell this is that, is the characters. I mean, that's a really big part of any fighting game. Um, PlayStation has become a much more successful brand with more iconic characters since this game released in 2012 2013 whenever it came out like since the ps4 there have been a lot more icons of playstation so just to list a few that i would add joel and ellie aloy from uh, horizon zero dawn and updated kratos nadine uh sam fisher from um uh 
Ooh, what's it called? He's Splinter Cell. That's it. Sam Porter Bridges from Death Stranding. Unjami Lammy from that game. Astrobot, Abe from Oddworld. The Hunter from uh, Bloodborne. Delson Rowe from Infamous. Noctis from Final Fantasy 15. And yes, I know that he is in Tekken. And even maybe Spider-Man because Sony still owns him. They might be able to make that happen. Um, also, since Nintendo does get third-party characters, they have mostly Nintendo characters, but they have a couple. They have Snake, they have Bayonetta, they have Cloud. Um, but they don't do a lot of like third-party multi-platform characters. And Xbox doesn't have a fighting game. So Sony might even be able to get characters like the Dragonborn from Skyrim, or Corvo from Dishonored, or Cal Kestis from Jedi Fallen Order. Like for the right price, I think they could they could swing that because there's not a lot of competition for it and it's, and it's advertising. Yeah, um, so I yeah. I like I oh we lost you. I like, like your new pitch. I, I like the mechanics sound. I like mm -hmm. the mechanics that you're proposing sound much better than whatever the fuck the original was, um, and very much more like uh, Tekken or Street Fighter. Mm -hmm. But so is your main sell in competition with those series gonna be the characters? So, I would say, in terms of the pitching to the competition people, pitching to the people who already play fighting games, saying, "Hey, come play this game." Uh, that is going to be the sell is the characters and just and solid combat. I'm not trying to break the mold with the combat. I'm trying to make it very solid and good. But okay. I still have one card up my sleeve. I have not yet revealed. I'm not, I'm not sold yet. I don't know if the characters are. Well, enough. maybe this will sell you. Okay. This game, PlayStation All PlayStation All Stars Battle Royale, will have an actual battle royale mode, a 2D side scrolling fighting game battle royale. It'll be similar to Smash Run from Smash Bros. for 3DS. So it's, again, 2D side-scrolling exploration. Um, the stages, again, it's one big stage. There's all sorts of weird stuff going on that makes combat different. Um, I think that uh, you'll be collecting items and uh, other things to be used. So there still is Smash inspiration without it being a clone. Um, and I think that, like, if you guys have heard of this game, Them's Fighting Herds, it was going to be at EVO this year before it got canceled. It's a, it's a competitive fighting game that basically looks like My Little Pony. Adorable. <laughs> um, and I think that game is evidence that a fighting game can succeed. Uh, a fighting game with a less than adult aesthetic can succeed on the merits of its mechanics. So again, I think if we design around a traditional fighting game, add in the, the hot, uh, interesting element of Battle Royale, and then also throw in a bunch of iconic characters. I think this game would sell like hotcakes. I need to hear more about this battle royale mode because okay. still, I... go ahead, Caitlin. Okay, I'm not a fan of very many fighting games. I don't really play them, even Smash. I'm like, I'll play it with friends, but I'm not a huge fan of it. Um, so I just, I don't really know what battle royale mode is. Like I kind a, of a battle, have an a battle idea. Royale? Like, you... That's what? like. A battle royale is like Fortnite or Call of Duty Warzone. It's okay. like the hundred people go, you know, usually a hundred people go in and like one person comes out. Okay. Um, and that's doing like gangbusters right now. Apex Legends, Call of Duty Warzone, Fortnite, Fall Guys even. Um, but nobody's done it with a fighting game. And I don't think anybody's done it side-scrolling either. Well, how, okay. how is this different from, say, Smash? Because with yeah. them, them's fight in herds, right? I think mm -hmm. part of the appeal with that is that it, it is an indie game. It's not competing for the same market that Smash is. That's the true. The game would be competing with, with Smash, and that's really hard. That's fun. true. So a couple things to say about that. One, yes, it is competing with Smash. But again, uh, this is not I think it is occupying an interesting, I think that more of its competition is fight other fighting games. That's how I see it, is more traditional fighting games is, is the competition. I think Street Fighter poses a greater threat to this game than Smash does. One, because Smash is only on Switch and this is only on PlayStation. Uh, but two, just because the mechanics in general are more similar to a traditional game. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I... Yeah, go for it. I, I think it would sell. I think you're right on that. I just don't think it would have like a long lasting value that like say Smash or Tekken or Street Fighter do. It doesn't have the, it doesn't have the uh, legacy 
I'll, I, I admit, I admit, this game, the first, you know, again, if we're talking, you know, we're doing a reboot, like, the first game was not that good, and a lot of this, this game and a lot of the characters haven't been around for a super long time. I understand. But I think part of that is a strength because we're willing to do weird shit, like make a fighting game into a battle royale. Yeah. Like, we are not confined by what has been as much. I think maybe the key for making this game sell to be popular would actually have to be pricing it lower. Interesting. I think. Sorry, I what, do you think? Because what did you say? Pricing, pricing the game lower. Oh, okay. 40? Relative, I don't know how much Smash sells for right now. Um, but, but yeah, lower that. So maybe 40. Yeah. Um, and really leaning into those characters because, mm -hmm. you know, battle royales are popular, but why don't I just go play one of those, right? Mm -hmm. Or why don't I just go play Smash? Right. I guess you're right. I think, again, the characters are going to be the draw. I just think, I think that the weakness of the first game was that they over relied on that. They said, hey, everybody's here for Big Daddy and Sackboy and Nathan Drake. We don't, like, we can just let this game kind of, the mechanics yeah, kind no. of ride, and it wasn't. But I think no, you you're definitely right. need good mechanics. I think if, right, I think if we do traditional, but I think you're, you're right that we should lean into, hey, do you want to come watch Sly Cooper fight, fight Joel? Like, that's fun. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. Yeah, good pitch. Good pitch, Matan. I think it's interesting. I had never heard of the original game, and if you described it to me, I would have said, oh, that's just a Smash ripoff. I've, yeah. it is. I've got it on my shelf in the other room. Yeah. <laughs> so I think it. you did a good job trying to, like, re revitalize it. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, the characters is definitely the biggest draw. That would be what got me to buy the game. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. All, All right. right, take it away, Caitlin. Yeah, so my reboot idea, I spent a lot of time thinking about what I wanted to reboot. And I settled on Resident Evil, which I feel like is a weird take because they're still making a lot of Resident Evil games. But the reason yeah. I chose this is because I don't even know what's going on in the franchise anymore. Oh. Like, I don't know if I ever knew what was going on in the franchise. I have played three games all the way through and multiple of the other ones I've played parts of. And I still don't understand what's going on in those games. <laughs> which, ones, which ones have you played all of? I have played Revelations 1, Revelations 2, and the remake of um, Resident Evil 2. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then I've played a little bit of 7, and I think a little bit of 8? I don't know. It's, it's, not, it's not out yet. Not 8, then. See, My, again, I don't know. Okay, okay. <laughs> Um, and I mean, part of it is my fault. I definitely have not played them in any sort of order. I've just kind of played, um, and I don't really know the lore that well, but I think that's also because they're kind of just being released. Like, I don't know, like they're, they're doing the remakes now. They did the revelations and I'm sure someone is a big Resident Evil fan and like knows all of this and is very mad that I don't, but, um, I think it's confusing and there's a lot of characters and a lot of different storylines and I think they just need to reboot and restart from scratch. And I think there are a lot of good characters and I think they could use those characters. And, oh, and I just saw in my notes, I looked up a lore, like videos of lore to figure out what was going on in this game to help with my pitch. There was a two hour video of everything to know. And I was like, that is so much, like two hours to figure out what's going on in this game. So I was just like, I can't do that. Um, but what I was saying, I like all the characters. I like a lot of what's going on. I like a lot of the storylines. So I think if we rebooted, and my pitch is going to be a lot more story-based. Um, I don't have a lot of like the mechanics. I like the mechanics in the game, especially Resident Evil 2. That was fun. Um, so we can keep the mechanics. We can keep what they're doing there. I really like that. But with the story, I wanted to start with Chris and Claire. They're the brother and sister, if you don't know. The kind of kind of two of the main characters. There's also like a lot of other main characters. Um, but I would like it to start with them. And they're just hanging out on a normal day. And then their car is attacked by someone who looks like a zombie. And then they're like, oh my gosh, we have to figure out what's going on. So Chris takes her to the police uh, yeah, the police station where he works and he has his like special units team, which is like stars. And there's a huge explosion before they get there, and they're both knocked out. And then you take over playing as Claire. Both Claire and Chris will be the two um, playable characters in the game. And you see you're playing as Claire, and it's all kind of hazy. You can't really move too well. And you see Chris be taken away by, like, men in, like, SWAT suits. Like, their faces are covered. You can't really tell who they are. 
and then a woman comes over grabs your hand and like guides you away and says come with me like I'll help you um and then this one I'm not sure about because I, again I don't know characters super well but I think that'd be cool if this was like Jill Valentine um and then she helps you you guys kind of set out to find Chris and figure out what's going on in the world she kind of fills you in a little bit she knows a little bit of what's going on in the world I don't know exactly why um this is it in is it in Raccoon City yes it'll be in Raccoon City um and then the game goes back to Chris and you're playing as Chris and he is with his stars team and they're telling him about Umbrella Corps and they you find out he knows a little bit about what's going on and like he knew a little bit about what was going on beforehand and they have to like figure out how to stop this and find like the doctor that can make the vaccine and so that's like the story that they go off on and then Claire's story is like finding Chris and figuring out like how to get out of the city and be safe um and yeah I don't have a ton I, I have a I have okay. a cr- I have a crazy idea. Yeah, go for it. Can I know a bit about Resident Evil, not a ton. I know a bit. Can we make this a Pokemon like red and blue sitch where you have one game where you're playing as Chris and one game where you're playing as Claire and Jill and they kind of overlap. That's cool. Is that crazy? That's kind of similar to like Resident Evil 2 and 3, the remakes they just did. Oh, you're right. They take place at the yeah. same time. Right, right, yeah. Right. But, like, it's That's still true. the same game, and you play. You can either choose, like, Leon's story or Claire's story. It's Yeah, I'm kind of imagining kind of like, I don't know if you guys know Kingdom Hearts Birth by Sleep, where there's, like, three different characters you can play as. And if you play them, the story is, like, similar but different. And so all of their stories are happening, and then you just choose which one you kind of play as, and they intersect. Yeah, and that's very cool similar idea. to Resident yeah. Evil 2. Okay. Um, so I actually like, also have a question. Yeah. Um... So you said that they did a reboot of Resident Evil 2 and 3? They did a remake. I don't think it's a a remake. Yeah. So how how does what they did in the remake compare to what you want to do for the for for the reboot of the first one? Um so the only similarities that I can see with I haven't played Resident Evil 3 yet. Um I've just played Resident Evil 2 remake. And the only similarities I can see is Claire is looking for Chris and we don't know where he's at and Chris isn't in the game at all. And that's like basically the only similarity and she goes to the police station to try to find Mm -hmm. him. Other than that, I mean, they're in Raccoon City and there's like zombie-like creatures. Yeah, I I like this idea. I agree with you that um, Resident Evil is, it has, I think in a lot of ways lost itself in its complexity. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that was one of the strengths of Resident Evil 7 was it was like largely unrelated. Yeah. It, it was related. And then there was that moment at the end that I won't spoil that's like, oh, wow, it is connected. But um, I I see what you're saying. I don't, I worry about throwing out all the lore. No, I don't want to throw out all the lore. I just want to restart it so that it makes more sense and then go dive into it again in a way that's clearer okay so just say like everything that's happened before so not it's not the lore that's being thrown out thrown out it's the actions like the previous the, the main narrative threat yeah the previous narrative that's being thrown out okay. so that stuff is thrown out and then it's just represented in a way that's clearer and more coherent and less okay. like wibbly wobbly timey okay i because i haven't played the series i really I wonder what it would be like to play your reboot, right, and take that as, like, the first Resident Evil game I've ever played. Like, how would that figure in, like, would I just keep playing sequentially? Like, how would that kind of work? Well, it'd be like the God of War reboot. Like, you don't have to play the old games, but mm. if you did, it would, like, add to it. But so, it doesn't... So, would there be, like, a reboot of the number two remake like to but keep I'm doing not, like this new I'm series not, like, taking resident evil one and rebooting resident evil one i'm just rebooting the series as a whole oh i see yeah so i don't okay. i've never played resident evil one i read some summaries on it and i think it has to do with like i think it was chris and jill i, I played There's, a bit of it yeah okay. um and i took like a little inspiration from it but it's not a reboot of that story it's just a reboot of the like entire Resident Evil franchise and mm-hmm. then yeah it can go from there like we can make sequels right right, right. I think um I think the internet would hate you <laughs> no. I, feel, I think so too a little bit yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah I think I, a lot I, of I, players would be mad about it 
Yeah, I but I think it. a lot of players would also love it. I kind of, you're right, and I, I I've kind of struggled to jump into the games. I think the the remakes one of two and three are kind of a good jumping on point, mm-hmm. but I it would be kind of I agree with you. It would be kind of cool to see to see a reboot that makes things a little bit more palatable mm-hmm. um, as a way to get into these like iconic games. Yeah, yeah. I, something I wrote here at the end of my pitch is like I just want to make the stakes a lot clearer too mm-hmm. because that's one of the things I've never really understood about the Resident Evil world. Like, is it a zombie apocalypse? It's not quite, but it's not. It's like there's these other creatures too, and it's like yeah. if we fail, is are these creatures going to take over the world? Like, is everyone mm-hmm. going to die? Mm-hmm. Good, I've never really point. understood the stakes, and like I've understood the stakes of individual games, which is why I've enjoyed individual games. But I've never understood the stakes of the world as a whole, and I think that would really benefit the world mm-hmm. building to create much higher stakes that we sure. understand as players. Sure. Great yeah. job. I think that I think I would enjoy playing that reboot. Um, I also want to say that like the issues that you have with the series um, are super. I think that's really common with like these really iconic series mm-hmm. um, with these franchises because like for me, I that comes up the most with WoW. Um, like I would love to get into World of Warcraft, but there's a bunch of content that just. If you didn't play the game when it first came out, you just can't go back and do it. Like, right. there are some, like, you can, like, read, like, you can go to different um, areas that were in different of, like, the expansions, but pre-cataclysm, you just can't, like, it's something you can't do, and so that's, like, lore you have to learn by doing research, and I, I just wish, like, there was, like, another version of WoW that new players could play. Yeah, mm-hmm. and I think you're right. It will it'll obviously piss off some like hardcore fans and I think that'll happen with any franchise that you're going to reboot. But I think this one would be a great one to reboot. Yeah. And I think it would appeal to a lot For of sure. new players because I think there's a ton of players who are just too intimidated to get into the games because there's so much and you don't know where to start. You're yeah. right. I agree. You know, all of the diehard PlayStation All-Stars Battle Royale fans are coming for me now. Yeah. <laughs> The, the three of them. them. The three. Yeah. yeah, the three whole fans that exist. All right. Well, I think that just about does it for our reboots. So let's let's discuss. I think yeah. I think these were all solid presentations. I think so. I have a question for us. Mm-hmm. Yes. How, how are we going to decide which, like, are we going based on, like, what could be the most profitable? That's, this is a good are question. Are we going, are we going based on what we would like to play? Hmm. So, yeah, I think the three categories are, what do the three of us want? Uh, what would do the best with money, you know, and what would do the best On critically? the market. What would do the best on the market and what would do best critically? What, we should yeah. pick one. What do you, <sighs> that's a good question. I think I want to go with critical consensus. What are what is going to be regarded as a good game? Okay. But but what do you guys think? It's a good game. Um, I think maybe we pick we we go through all three of those options. I think okay. That's... And then maybe we can decide one at the end. Let's evaluate okay. each three and then say which one we think overall. Okay. Okay. So. Um. Let's see. Let's start with Adriana's. Um, Stardew Valley. Um, I, I like think. This idea. Uh, sorry. Um, I like this idea. I personally don't know if I would play it unless it has a stronger narrative, just because I prefer narrative games. That's for um, you personally. Yeah, that's for me personally. But I do think it would do well. So. I, yeah. I agree. I, I definitely want like a kind of like a closed open world, right? So like kind of what The Last of Us did with uh, Seattle. So like a closed open world with a narrative structure, um, but like with enough freedom to do things like farming. Like if I, you- Yeah, you still have to play to the game's strengths, but I think you I think, I think that Stardew m- might be my pick overall even, I'll say. I think that Stardew Valley did tremendously well, uh, both critically and um, uh, in the market financially thank you um so i think if we keep what made it great and expand upon the lore like i really think we're only going to increase the 
player base. I don't think we're going to lose almost anyone. Yeah, I think this um, one's it really would good. it would be it would be new players too. So it's not mm -hmm. right. Like, That's right. what I was going to say. It would appeal. It. It would appeal to new players With, and without losing old players, unlike totally. mine, which would like alienate old players but appeal to new ones. Totally. So, yeah. um, mine I think is really okay. I think Adrianus is a very strong contender. Yeah. Um, mine, I think, I think the iconography of of the characters and like I think that that could do very well in the at the market. Mm -hmm. I think critic wise it would be just like middle of the ground because it doesn't have anything groundbreaking but it, I think it would still be good. The most groundbreaking part is the battle royale mode but that's, but that's also, also again, again not I think going to be the best part of this game mm -hmm. so I think you're probably right. I agree. I th I also think it's a little bit of a gamble. Like mm -hmm. I like it, it could turn out really well. And I, I can't even begin to like think like, what are the factors that can make this better or worse, like received in market? Um, I think it has a lot of potential, which is really scary. Mm. Yeah, it, you're right. It's kind, of an un, it's kind of an unknown. It's kind of hard to know. Is this gonna get the competitive market? Is this gonna get the casuals? Like, who is this for? That's mm -hmm. true. Um, and so I think I would love, I would play the shit out of this game. Um, this is the one that I would want to play the most personally, um, but I don't know if it would do better than Stardew. It's hard, it could, but I think Stardew is prob would probably do better in the market and critically. Yeah, I mean, Stardew is more niche, is the thing for sure. Like they've got a smaller audience, but they've also got like a way more dedicated audience. That's true. Um, so, uh, I, I mean, if, in theory, if, if all the PlayStation users were attracted to this game, mm -hmm. it could be really popular. Especially, it could be. especially if we put it out early in the PlayStation 5's life cycle. That's true. Yeah. Um, but I want to say, I just did some Googling. Stardew Valley has sold over 10 million copies across its six platforms, wow. making it one of the most uh, successful indie titles in gaming. That's from tweaktown.com. Don't know who named that site, but um, that's... Uh, 10 million is, is nothing to scoff at. It is indie, but I knew yeah. a lot of people who do it. Absolutely. It's indie, but it's it, it's indie where it becomes like lower on the mainstream scale. Sure, 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 sure. And then Resident Evil. It, like it's mainstream. For sure. Yeah. Resident Evil, I think, Caitlin, I think that one of the reasons this is going to do great in uh, economically, financially, is the name recognition. Mm -hmm. um, Resident Evil is riding high right now. Res well, Resident Evil 2 yeah. Remake did super well. Incredible. And Resident Evil 3 Remake did well as well. Not quite as well. Mm -hmm. um, I, personally, this would be the one I would play the most. Um, but that's also because I just don't... The other two genres aren't my favorite. And this, I love horror games. So this Yeah, I was going to say... Like, I think we all want to play yeah. the one we <laughs> yeah. pitch, So I think maybe that category just doesn't matter anymore. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I think, yeah, I think this is also a, a risk um, because Red and e Resident Evil fans, you know, can be intense. Again, they've... Mm -hmm. Resident Evil 3 got a lot of shit. I don't know. But I if old fans love it, then I think it would be... I think it's a safer really risk. Well. Yeah. It's safer than mine, yeah. Yeah. But overall, I'm inclined to say Stardew takes this. I think you guys so. Think. Yeah. Aww. All right. All right. So that's, I mean, two out of three say Stardew and, you know, Adrienne, it's her own. So I think. Right. Thanks. I was totally deal. happy to like go with Resident Evil because like it sounds mm -hmm. interesting. Um, it is it's interesting. also a series I couldn't get into. Um, but financially too, I do think like this. Yeah, I think yours, like, it could be really good. Yeah, I think Stardew takes it because of financially, but I'm proud of my story pitch for Resident Evil. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, for it, sure. I was intrigued. Thank you. Absolutely. Um, all right, Adriana, you are up with the first sequel. Yes. I also want to preface this whole kind of section. I think Caitlin's going to win. Like, I, I actually <laughs> don't know that, like, they're, like, I, I mean, I'm happy to, like, pitch my sequel, but I think she's going to win. I have um, two whole pages. Yeah. Maybe maybe I, I shouldn't have taken such big risks. Maybe I should have got, gone one with one a more solid one. Maybe I should have said Kingdom Hearts three reboot like I wrote. I should, maybe well, I should have I done mean, that. I went with yeah. the Resident Evil reboot, which is very mainstream, and Adriana still won. So that's true. Yeah. I just yeah. I've spent 
months developing this not months but like months yeah like two months i've had this idea for this sequel we'll, we'll get there yeah. you know what yeah we'll get there adriana take it away so i can't quite remember but have you i think i streamed this on zoom once uh, yeah, you did. Oh, yeah, you did. I remember this. Like, to you guys. Yeah. We were helping you, like, pick out the outfit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, all right. So, you guys, listeners, audience, viewers, my pitch is a sequel for Max Gentleman Sexy Business. Um, so, this is an indie game dating simulator, kind of, not really. Um... <laughs> It is, Mark, the like description on Steam is Max Gentleman Sexy Business is a hilarious and titillating romp through Victorian era London as a social elite. Your family, bleh, your family business has been stolen and you must partner with other powerful executives, fight your rivals and regrow your business to its former glory. And also there's like a lot of porn. Um, <laughs> so that's kind of like the appeal of the game. Like if, if you played Honey Pop, Honey Cam, like that's it. So this is Management Tycoon meets it. Also, you can like put filters on so it doesn't actually have to be not safe for work. You, you can, can okay. just do it for work version and it's still a very fulfilling game. Yeah, so it's still a very fulfilling game either way. Like these are complicated, unique characters with quirks. Um, they're often based on kind of like things. So like there's a guy who's like very much like... Um, the vampire Dracula, he's like Dracula, and there's like Santa Claus, but not like different names, obviously, and stuff. Um, but like they're themed, it's exciting, it's cool. Um, who doesn't love Victorian England? I mean, the clothes, the like poshness of it all. India, it's probably. And rich. Uh, yeah. <laughs> You're not wrong. <laughs> You're not wrong, that's not what I meant. But I get your point. I really, I really liked what I saw of this game when you streamed it for us. It is a really fantastic game. Like, even if you're not in it for, like, the dirty mag picks, right? Like, if you're not in it for that, it's still a really fun tycoon game, um, yeah. which is, like, definitely, like, my kind of genre. Like, I love fucking the tycoon simulator, like, the roller coaster one or, like, the zoo one that was on the DS. Um, and so, literally, my pitch for a sequel is just another one. Like, just new yeah. characters. I don't care if it's the same mechanics. Maybe, like, it can be, like, a different, like, um, theme. So, like, in this one, like, you have to restart your business and so you can power with, like, the fashion industry or, like, the railroad industry or whatever. And we can do, like, a different theme. I don't really care. Um, I just want more of it. I think yeah. for the strengths of the game, visuals. Um, I think it's like the challenge in micromanaging and minutia. I think, you know, like the dressing of what it is isn't actually super important. I think it's just fun. Interesting. There is, I'm going to plug the game, there's a substantial free update coming in, in this fall, in 2020 fall. Um, and that's really exciting. Very exciting. Uh, so I just want another one. Cool. That's, just added you know two, put new characters. That's fine. I think for the sequel category, I think that's enough. Yeah. I have, like, no ideas about plot. It could be almost the same thing. Just, like, a different <laughs> villain. Maybe yeah. you're the same person and just a different villain comes in and steals your company. I'm cool with that. I mean, yeah, if the first one works, why change it? Yeah. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. Yeah. yeah. Um, I am up next. Uh, another one that I think you guys may not have heard of, uh, this one's a little more popular than PlayStation All-Stars. It's uh, Kirby Air Ride. Um, this is one of my favorite games of the GameCube era, which is like one of my favorite eras in gaming. This is one of the games I played the most as a kid. Um, I'm trying to remember, I might have played this. I played a Kirby game on the GameCube, but I don't know if it was this. So what is this game? So yeah. it's kind of... There's a, a lot of racing elements. I don't know if I'd call it a, a racing game. No, I you, love this game. Sorry, I just Googled you it. You do? Yes, I love this uh, game. Maybe I have a shot. Maybe I have a <laughs> shot. Um, basically, you, as plays Kirby, and you can, there's a couple different modes. The most important one to me is called City Trial, 
yes. you basically, oh you explore this city area, this sm small little sort of open world city area. It's, it's small, but it's very dense. There's a lot oh. of really cool little things in there. A little Easter eggs, a little tricks to learn. Um, so basically, the, the generally you play it as you go into city trial, you start on just like the regular shitty car. It's just a little star. And then you drive around competing with up to, you know, up to three other players, four total. And you find other cars to ride that have different stats. You know, they're better at, this one's, be, you know, better acceleration, worse top speed. This one's good at flying. This one's good at braking. Um, and you also get pow like stat boosts. You, you know, get a, a top speed boost. You get a weight down. Um, and you so drive around. This, this sounds like Mario Kart. So it is, so I knew somebody was going to say that. It is, yeah. it is. Different from Mario Kart, I think, because it is you are increasing your stats, getting Kirby types, and changing cars just on the fly. Like as you're in the oh. game, you hop off your car, run over to the little other one, mm -hmm. and get on that. Also, okay. in that like city area, it if I remember correctly, it wasn't racing. It was just like it's not doing it, random things. It's free roam for like eight yeah. minutes. Yeah. Um, and you just get, you break little boxes to get stat boosts or types, or, you know, if your friend has a really good car, you can go over to them and use your, one of your, you know, you get fire types, shoot them with fire until their car breaks and they have to go run around and find another one. Um, and then at the end, as the timer runs, also events can happen too. Yeah, there's like the meteors. There's, the meteors come down or there's a big healing spot where you can get your health back mm -hmm. and then everybody's rushing there and trying to knock each other out. Or there's a giant bird that comes down, Dino Blade, yeah. and you can destroy oh it to goodness. get really good uh, power-ups and stuff. And then at the end of the time, uh, a random event happens. Um, there are things like uh, mm -hmm. flying as high as you can, or a, you know, a, a race, or just a drag race, it's just like a straight track, or target flight, which is one where you have to, um, there are a bunch of different boxes that have different points, and you have to try to navigate to hit the right points, or fighting King DDD as a boss. Mm -hmm. It's so much fun. Uh, my, <laughs> this is a quick little anecdote. My brother, my brother is three months older than I am. He's my stepbrother. We basically raised the same age. There's not like a lot of a big brother dynamic there, but this is one of the times in which there is a big brother dynamic. In this game, there are two legendary cars. There's the one that is really fast and really strong, and then there's the one that's pretty fast but good at flying. And so my, we would play this game. It's just, just the open world known forever. We just set the timer to infinite, infinite. And I would go down the flying one, and he would get on the really powerful one, and the whole goal of our little game was for him to, to kill me, there was literally no way for me to win that game. It was just run away for as long as you can. And he would, again, he will always win. Um, but it was just so much fun. I don't know. It was nice to get to know this place. So for my sequel, I want to do the classic things, which are way more different cars, way more different types for Kirby. That's my favorite thing about a Kirby game is getting new types or like mixing type. They would always do new little gimmicks with types. And I love that. Um, I want, I don't want a bigger map. I want more maps of the same size and density. I want like seven or eight of the cities, you know? Yeah. I, like, cause I want, I still want the intimacy. I loved knowing every little corner. Like mm -hmm. I, I loved knowing where all the Easter eggs are. And so I want that again, but just more, more kinds of challenges. I was thinking maybe make drift, make driving a little more technical. Um, there isn't really drifting. Well, not officially, you can kind of drift depending on your car but maybe make driving just a little bit more technical so that there's more competition. Um, I will say the drifting feature, although I drive a stick, um, is one of the things I do hate about Mario Kart. Um, really? It makes it harder. Yeah, mm -hmm. it, it makes the game harder for me, and maybe that's because I'm, I'm just not good at the controls. Um, it's because you suck. No. <laughs> <laughs> so basically, like, I don't know. I think there's a lot you can do to improve this game slightly that would make a big difference without really changing up the core. Um, like exploring these worlds with friends and like competing and, you know, it's like, it is competitive, but it's still pretty whimsical. It's just so much fun. Um, oh, and also we can ditch the top down mode. There's this weird other mode that's like top down, like little weird races. Just ditch that. Nobody needs that. Um, but it's honestly criminally criminally overlooked there was a leak or a fake box art posted like 10 years ago for a wii sequel and it never happened i don't know what happened to it that makes me so sad it, i know so sad. i would i would just every day in my like computer class i would just like google like kirby air ride sequel and it never came Poor kid. this will be it yes. this is um, how we make it great i was gonna say this this kind of i mean i've never played the game 
Um, but it, it feels to me something like a, like a mix between like Overwatch and Mario Kart. How so? Uh, like that famili familiarity with the maps and like that, sure. that vibe with your friends is something that I feel a lot in Overwatch. Like sure, I know like, I get you. Okay, you go into this building and there's that thing there. Um, and that's what I, this is one of my favorite things about Overwatch or like that, that genre of games or like Paladins and whatever. Um, I think this is like, we're getting into the judgment zone, but this could be super successful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think an online mode where you can play totally. online with friends totally. in these yeah. areas would be great yeah. because that was the biggest draw for me when I was younger. I would sit there with my sister and our neighbor. We would play for hours, just like you did. We'd set time to infinity and then we would just, <sighs> I don't even remember, we would like, I think we had this like one area that we would try to like defend from each other and whoever like we would sometimes do a timer and whoever ended up in that area at the end was like That's so cute. Winner. I love yeah. that. Like making your own little games like me and my brother like exactly. in this world. Exactly. Yeah. Like I remember I think it was the area like under that big tree or something like you Yeah, know, like, there's like a yeah. secret place under there. Yeah. yeah. We, we had that as like our castle or something and then it was like whoever ended in that area was the winner. That's so cute. Yeah, I love it. That's really cute. Um, so finally, we've got Kate Lentz, which is going to be maybe the most, the most demanding, the most in-depth of this a episode. Chunky boy. Yes, it's a you know what? chunky boy. We need all the time we can get. Caitlin, go for it. All right. So, uh, The Last of Us 2 spoilers? Yes. Disclaimer? Last of Us 2 spoilers. If you don't want them, skip ahead or end here. It's been a great podcast so far. Um, but... <laughs> I am pitching the sequel for The Last of Us 3. Um, I, as I have said before, I was not a huge fan of the story of The Last of Us 2, but I didn't hate it. I did, I loved the game, but the story was like, eh, to me, there's parts I didn't love. Disappointing. Yeah, it was disappointing. It was disappointing. Um, yeah, maybe Adriana. The game was disappointing. The podcast about why it was disappointing. Um, we touched on it a little bit before, but we haven't fully gone into it, but it was disappointing to me, and I think a third game could save it for me. And this was something we had talked about too. And I'm, yes. this is why I was like, I think Caitlin's going to win just because I like, I need this in my life. Yeah. So I did pitch this to Adriana like a month you, and a half ago. Or you told me about it too. Yeah. Just... I, yeah. I think both of you. Yeah. And I've added more to it since. Um, it's two pages long. I'm going to try to go through it quick. Um, <laughs> yeah. So when we advertise the game, it's going to be advertised as an Abby and Love story. We'll see a little bit of Ellie, but very similar to how the second game was advertised, where it was mostly Ellie, but you saw Joel a little bit in there. But mm -hmm. you will end up being able to play as Abby, or I mean, as Ellie. She will be a playable character, and it will be very similar to the second game, where it switches between the two. So the game will start with Abby and Love, and it will be pretty close to where the second game left off. They're still looking for the fireflies. Um, and some of these details I just kind of wrote in here, they can obviously be changed. These aren't set yet, but I want them to head to somewhere like Nevada. Um, they like heard the fireflies are set up there. So they start heading there and then they come across like maybe a group or someone that they, that Abby says not to help, but Lev wants to help them because Lev is sweet and nice and I love Lev. Um, but this group, attacks them and betrays them and it ends with Abby being bit by a clicker. So they are scared and Abby wants Lev to kill her but Lev does not want to kill Abby so they just kind of waited it out similar to what Ellie and Riley did but Abby never changes and they are confused so they decide to head to Utah to get answers back to where everything began and they head there and first we'll switch, this will be the first time in the story we'll switch to Ellie and you'll see Ellie for the first time. And she's back in Jackson, she's living alone and we'll kind of see her, just her everyday life of, she's very lonely, she's not doing well. Um, she goes to visit Dina and JJ and they're doing great, but they don't really want, well, at least Dina doesn't really want anything to do with Ellie um she's like nice to Ellie but she's kind of obviously angry about everything that happened and she still doesn't think that Ellie is in a good place in her life and she doesn't think that Ellie's doing well so she kind of pushes Ellie to like kind of go on a journey to find herself so Ellie decides she, she wants to go on some soul searching so she goes and talks to Tommy and Tommy says maybe you can go back to Texas to where uh, <clears throat> sorry 
to where uh, Joel and Sarah lived. And Tommy asks if Ellie does this to bring back a picture for him. And she's like, okay, this is a good idea. So Ellie sets out to Texas alone. And the first half of the game for Ellie is going to be very lonely. You're going to feel that loss of like being alone, not having anyone there with you. And that's going to feel very heavy on the player and very contrasted to Abby and Lev being together and very contrasted to in the past, Ellie always, almost always being with someone. So then, and we'll also deal with Ellie's like PTSD along the way. You'll see a lot of her journey of like going through this and like what she's feeling very much seeing her shifting as a character and dealing with all her past regrets and everything she hasn't been like hasn't dealt with from the second game. So I have an idea like, for a moment. Yeah, what is it? That so like she's going back to Joel's home, right? And one of the things connecting her to Joel is the guitar. So I would love for Ellie to bring the guitar with her. And we, we see her playing it a few times, um, and then maybe... Bring it with her? Yeah, bro. Carry a guitar. I'm down. She's not really planning. I mean, obviously, she's planning to deal with clickers and, like, the zombies. Right, she's, right. like, stealth. Like, she doesn't... The yeah. guitar's too big. No, I, I like this. She's big. She's strong. What she can bring play? a ukulele. She can bring a ukulele. No. She can bring the guitar. Hey, she, I like this. She can play that with her fingers. The guitar, like on her case, in the in a case on her back. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry. Have you played a video game? People have like twelve foot swords on them. Yeah. <laughs> Ellie doesn't. Anyway, Adriana, go on. Anyways, and then I want her to be like close to home, and then she gets. I don't know. I haven't flushed this out. She gets ambushed either by zombies or by people, like a group, and she ends up having like they disarm her or whatever. And she ends up having to use the guitar as like a weapon. Oh, um, and it breaks. I actually do kind of like that. She has yeah, to break like it that. to save herself. Okay, she has I'm to break it. I'm back in. Thank Sorry. you. I'm back in. Like Sorry. I'm I back really in. Like Thank that. you. I, there is a part later where she gets ambushed. So, and it's by someone specific. Or did I keep that? I don't know. We'll get there. Oh, yeah, I, there I are details. Ideas. We'll we'll get there. Um. Okay. So, she. Where did I leave off? Uh. Yeah. We're just. She's on her way. Um. And then we go back to Abby. Abby and Love. They make it to the hospital, and Abby learns that her dad knew she was a mutant by doing tests with her blood. And she is confused and sad and angry because she knew that her dad knew that she was immune, but her dad still chose to do this to Ellie instead. And that's yeah. what started all of this. There's that great moment in Last of Us 2, the flashback with yeah. Marlene, in which she's like, she's like, what would you do if this was Abby? Um, and then now, now it is. Exactly. So that's, that's interesting. That, yeah. that, I, I like that choice for that moment. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. It, I think it would be really cool if it was in that very same room that that scene mm. happens from The Last of Us 2 in. And we kind of, and like, if you're a fan, obviously you'll realize that and you'll see that like parallel there. Yeah. And then Abby at this point is also now convinced that she can save the world where Ellie failed. And, like, she still doesn't like Ellie at this point. So she's thinking, Ellie failed to save the world, but I'm going to save the world. So they ask around, and they try to find anyone who's still working on a cure. And they find, or at least they hear a rumor somewhere up in, like, Canada. Someone's working on a cure. So they set out to Canada. And then we can skip ahead a ton. I'm sure we can, there's going to be, like, lots of conflicts on the way. They run into lots of people to fight, lots of zombies, clickers to fight. Um, and then she gets there and she learns that the doctor working for the cure or the vaccine or whatever does not need to kill her. They just need a sample of her blood. And she learns that her dad was wrong in how he was about this. Uh, yeah, I have one too. Go ahead, Jenna. Instead of blood, because that, that feels really simple, maybe something more complicated like bone marrow or whatever. Well Bone marrow, well, that's good. I'm also going off of a video Matt Pat did for uh, Game Theory, and he said, I believe in the mm -hmm. video, he said all they would have needed was blood. But so, I also know absolutely okay. nothing about viruses. And, yeah, so. I was going to say, this has nothing to do with real life. I was going to say, I think I know where we're going with yeah, this. Yeah, um, me either. Let's have, so they needed it to get to Ellie's brainstem at the end of the first game, and that's why she was going to die. So how mm -hmm. about this? If they know that they can have two subjects, then they don't need to be that invasive. That's, they yes, no, that's where we're getting to. That's okay. what, yeah, so, that's what I was So doing. I think that's a good reason. Yeah. Maybe her dad wasn't wrong, 
they do need a brainstem if there's only one. Okay. Oh wait, no, but see that undoes it. D no, that doesn't work because if that undoes it, because then if he knew that Abby didn't have to- He do would have just done both of right, them. Right, so scratch um, that, scratch that. We, we can consult with someone who knows science. <laughs> yeah, I'm also, again, I don't know science, so I don't know if Matt and Pat's yeah. video, the Game Theorist video is good or like, not, correct. but he basically goes off and says that like, the doctor was wrong and you don't need to like go to the bone marrow. In fact, that was like the worst possible idea you could have done because if they don't find the cure off of that, then you just killed your only immune subject. And like he was saying like you can do tests with the blood and I, I should have watched the video before this so I could remember, but he said there was a way to do it without going to the brain. So that's what I was going off of for this part. Yeah, here. I mean, it could but, work that like this is just a more knowledgeable scientist or community. Yeah. Scientists. Um, it also feels like a little shitty that like the solution was so simple. Like it's, it's yeah. just blood. But also um, I'm saying, so part of where I was going next was they yeah. tell her that it will like they can't really do much with just her blood because it's just one person and it could just be an anomaly with her. So they're saying if you like if there is someone else immune, we might be able to make a cure because then we can test multiple samples mm -hmm. and see what the similarities are and see why both of you are immune. So then yeah, yeah. that's where Abby sets out to go find Ellie. Yeah. So she starts to head to Seattle. And then we go back to Ellie. Um, Ellie is back in Texas and she's found Joel's old home. Um, and then, I don't know, this kind of gets a little crazy. I don't know about this, but I was thinking she finds the picture that Tommy was asking for and it is an old baby picture of Sarah. And Joel is holding Sarah with a woman standing next to him, presumably Sarah's mom, and then two other people standing next to them. It's like at a barbecue or something. And then Ellie flips the picture over, and the picture says Joel, Anna, Sarah, Marlene, and then like whatever Marlene's mom's name would be. And then, if I remember right, I think Anna's name was, uh, or Anna is the name of Ellie's mom, right? Uh, I think so. Okay. I should have looked that one up also. I did this at like midnight. That's okay. Um, but yeah, so this could presumably be that Sarah's mom was the same mom as Ellie's. And that's what Ellie's discovering here. And no one knew just because oh. it was so far apart and in the apocalypse. Like Joel had no idea where Anna was after the apocalypse happened. Is she dead? Uh, yes, I believe Marlene, you can find like a recording that Marlene says she died in the first game. Wait, Marlene's mom or Anna? No, Anna. I'm sorry, I'm a little okay. confused. Who, whose mom is also, who is? So Anna, Anna. Sarah's mom. So Anna and, is and also... Joel were like together yeah. and they had Sarah and then they split up. Joel doesn't really ever talk about her. He mentions her a few times. And now she's Ellie's mom? Yeah, so then they, like, split up. They don't know where they went. And then Anna just had a child, and that happened to be Ellie. So she wasn't dead pre-apocalypse? I always got the vibe that she was dead pre-apocalypse. I got the vibe. I don't know oh, if they she? said that. No, but I don't also, think that was Even if she's said. not, I kind of I kind of hate that. Really? I kind of hate that. I always that. thought Ellie and Sarah looked similar. They do, but, like, that total... To me, that really diminishes the sort of message of found family. Like, sure, Joel's not her father, but, like, yeah. but like he, she's the daughter of his, of his ex-wife. Then she's Sarah's sister. Right. And that's, like, adding, I don't, I, I, just yeah, think, I don't super like it. Okay, yeah, this was just kind of, like, random that I added in. We don't need to do this part, but I think it would be, because I needed something to get her to go to Boston, because I wanted her to go to Boston. And that was what I thought would work, because then she'd be like, oh, my gosh, like, who is this? Like, why does she have the same name as my mom? Like, is All that right. connected? We can, we can fill it in. She goes to Boston. Yeah. And it could just be a coincidence. It could, like, they could have the same name. Or the Marlene thing could be what caused Sure, Marlene. Boston sure. Because, like, knowing Joel knew Marlene before the apocalypse. Sure. Cool. So she goes to Boston. Um, and then she's going through Joel's old stuff, and she gets attacked by someone. And this could be where, like, she breaks her guitar. Um, and then I wasn't sure about who this could be. I thought it'd be cool if this was someone, like, related to Tess somehow again this is kind of getting like too much into like randomly found relationships that were connected to the earlier games um which like would be too much of a coincidence oh and then i forgot to say the quarantine zone that like joel and tess used to live in is like now just destroyed 
um mm. it doesn't it's not there anymore really so she's able to just go in and like see joel's old stuff um and then that's when this girl attacks her and then again i don't know it could be some relationship that might just be too much um i'm fine if it's not but this person then joins the journey with ellie and it's kind of like they're both very quiet people but we start to see ellie opening up again to a new person and then they start to make their way back to um Seattle and again I don't know exactly why they would make their way back to Seattle but they do um and then okay so Abby so we'll switch back to Abby at this point and then Abby gets to Washington and then I don't know how she's going to convince them because I'm pretty sure Tommy would kill her on site but she somehow convinces them to tell her where Ellie is and they end up crossing paths somehow meeting somewhere along the way and they, Ellie, or Abby explains everything to Ellie. They decide to head up to Canada um, about the vaccine or, like, to figure out that stuff. Um, maybe they're kidnapped along the way. There's some stuff, you know, a little more conflict before they can get there. Then they finally get there. Um, or while they're being kidnapped, they, like, have their conversation. They, like, finally bond and be like, oh, my gosh, we were, like, the same person. They learned that. They um kind of discuss together and like figure out how to heal together and forgive their both both their like father figures together because they're both kind of now in the same boat of like their fathers did something bad and they can't forgive them because or they can't tell them they've forgiven them because they're dead and they're both dealing with that and I think they would like help each other through that and they would like learn to be okay with each other and then they finally make it to the lab and they test Ellie's blood and I think there would be two possible endings I think that they could develop the vaccine and we see Ellie return home and we flash forward like 20 years and we see Ellie and Dina happy together, new world after the apocalypse. Um, JJ is all grown up. We see him happy. We, you know, we go through, see all the characters live in their happy lives. That's the very happy ending. And then the other one is just kind of a very, um, just like we, see or we hear them say like this might be enough for a vaccine and then but it'll be years before anything happens if this is you guys can go on living your lives we have enough and then we just kind of see ellie again go back to the uh to jackson and then um yeah that's where that one would end i think either way the game would end with joel or with ellie at joel's grave and just saying like she forgives him yeah, I, I like the more ambiguous ending, um, because that's very The Last of Us for, mm -hmm. for I think. That um, looks too happy, but I like it. I, I, I know, but I mean, that, that could be plausible in the ambiguous ending, right? I mean, exactly. yeah, it could all be right. happy. That's, um, what I, that's what I like better about the ambiguous ending, is like, it's, it, leaves room f it leaves room for hope without being heavy handed. Exactly, yeah. Um, yeah. I don't like her being at going to Joel's grave. This is kind of my issue with, with the whole pitch i think there's some really interesting parts but like ellie's acceptance of her relationship with joel was kind of the point of the last of us 2 and so by making this whole game about that again you're kind of undoing any character growth she had in the second game i disagree she didn't have any character growth yeah that is so she had she had a character down she had she did she, had she did have character down. All, she did have character down it did not go back up much on. Yeah. It did. So and that was think, the ending. That ever, was her choice. I don't think she ever forgave Joel in The Last of Us. That is, that is the moment when she's going to kill Abby and then she thinks of Joel. That is her forgiving Joel. I don't, I don't see it as that. Or, what about the time when she says to him, I don't know if I can forgive you, but I'm going to try. Yeah, she's going to try. But I think the problem is she the game ends with her never having the chance to forgive Joel and she- But that's real. That. But that's real. real. That is, is loss. Real. And she yes. forgives him to herself. She can't forgive him to him because he's dead. No, and I don't think we ever see that. I don't, that's Wait, one of my- mo What do you think? So how did you read the moment where she's go drowning Abby and then she thinks of Joel positively and then lets her live? How did you I read, read that? that as Ellie realizing that revenge is not the answer and a cycle of violence will just continue if she kills. So what does Joel have to do with that? Because Abby killed Joel. And that's what she's remembering here. She's remembering that Joel time. kills her father and it's, it's yeah. he right. is the, the violent. I yeah. think forgiveness is, and revenge are really big themes of Last of Us 2. Um, but I just feel like 
this ha like having having Abby be immune like I like the moment I like the moment of Abby discovering that she's immune I don't like the the choice to have her be immune because like what are the odds Ellie is literally the only person we've ever seen be immune and then the only other person we find is immune is not only somebody who meets Ellie but is also the child of the doctor who could undo it and on top of that I think having there be another doctor who can do vaccine better undoes the ending of the first game because the, the reason that choice is so impactful of Joel being like, I'm going to choose Ellie is because he's literally damning the world for the person he loves. And that is, that is a fin fantastic story moment. But I think- yeah, I agree there, but I, I don't know. I don't think it undoes that. I think at the time that was the only option. And I think for years it would be the only option. And I think because maybe at the time that was the only option and they just hadn't figured out other options yet, but now there's a doctor that did figure out another option. You know, it takes time to develop and figure things out with medicine, especially. That's, that's especially true. Especially after all centers of science are completely destroyed and you have to spend 20 right. plus years rebuilding. Right, that's just my thinking of why it's not gonna get, not gonna get easier than how it was. Like, I don't know, I, I just think it's kind of, I don't like that, like the, the reason Joel being able, like, okay, Ellie and Abby being able to uh, work together and make a vaccine for basically no cost, to me kind of, I don't know, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't like the, the taste it leaves in my mouth. I disagree. And I don't know, I think what you said about it being like too rare to have these two people be immune. I don't think that's true. I think it makes sense that this doctor's daughter would be immune. That's why he's what? looking for a cure and why he thinks there could be a cure because he knows someone's immune. But he doesn't want to use his daughter as sacrifice. So he's been waiting for years to find someone else. Okay. Um, but I, okay, I, I, I guess it just still seems to me like odd that like, yeah, it makes sense that that would be his drive, but like the fact that he would have, you know, medical degree with a focus on epidemiology, you know, um, and then his daughter. Maybe he did something. Maybe she was a but science did, baby. But if she did something, then why can't he do it again? Uh, moral regret. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, I think a lot of the second half more so of your pitch, Caitlin, could you know, do with a rework and like- Yeah, I mean, it's definitely not of... like fully developed. It's not like this would yeah. be the game, but it's, it's a starting point of this would be like what I would want to see, rough idea. I like the yeah. guitar. I, I didn't yeah, like the I guitar like... and now I like the guitar. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, we don't want it to be just her for giving Joel for what some people might be again. Um, no, and, and I don't I, think that would be Ellie. I think there's more. Yeah, that would not be Ellie's yeah. only drive in this whole story and like only character development. But for me, making this pitch at like, you yeah, know, yeah, 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 like having a week to do this pitch. Yes, sure. that's what um, I know is Ellie's main goal for what I was doing. Right, and like and one one strength of the. Yeah, one strength of The Last of Us is, is new characters, bringing new characters into this world and making it feel lived in, right? Like we had Tess and Abby and all the fucking people. Um, and like the bitch is missing, like all, all the other people that would like populate this. Um, sure. So like there's there's more to add, Matan. Like I think your, yeah. your concerns are real, um, but like for what this pitch is, right? Just like us on a podcast. I think it's pretty solid. I think it's a really good idea because a lot of people didn't like The Last of Us 2, like a, like a significant amount. Um, and I think having this third one that is is the, you know, the rest of the up that we don't get with Ellie is, is her finishing her growth cycle um, could be really useful. So I'm for it. I also, you know, it's divisory, like we're seeing with the three of us. Um, so I don't know that it would be like a financial success. Um, I, I still think it would be just because of how mm -hmm. big the game is and the second game is extremely mm -hmm. divisive but still extremely yeah. yeah I'm with Caitlin I kind of think the opposite I think this game would not do well critically just because of the division I think because of The Last of Us 2 The Last of Us 3 no matter what it is almost certainly I think is going to be really divisive yeah um, so I think this game just by not by nature of your your explanation just by nature of the game 
mm -hmm. think is going to not going to do well critically. I think it will do very well financially. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Um, Especially with like how much information you give a base, give the base via mm -hmm. trailers and stuff. Yeah, um, that's why, again, I think it would be great like we didn't really know much as an Abby Lev story. Yeah. yeah. Um, then let's go up to my sequel, as I'm talking through. Mm -hmm. um, I think I think that Kirby Air Ride would do very well critically and in terms of uh, and financially. I think it's a, yeah. a family game that is also appeals to nostalgia. Kirby always does really well. Um, you know, Mario Kart... Mario Kart exists and Mario Kart has done so well on the Switch. Like I think having another like driving family game that you can just pop out a Joy-Con and hand to someone I think could do really yeah. well. I do think Kirby has lost a little bit of its impact over the mm. years. Like 10 years ago Kirby was like, oh my god. But now That's Kirby, true. like especially if you look at like younger audience, I don't think Kirby would have the same draw as like Mario would. Maybe not as Mario. He's had yeah, there but, have been some stinkers. But who Switch. wants another like Mario game? No, I totally agree. I'm just saying it might be a little, and like, especially our age would love it, but like the ten, Yeah, the slightly younger, yeah. They, I think they would be a little hard to appeal to with Kirby right now, but I think it would still do great, and I think if they got into it, it would do amazing. I think sure. that's all on the marketing and can probably be solved fairly easily, so I think, mm -hmm. I think I'm going to vote for Matans just because I, like, it it's not a risky bet. It seems safe. It's a, it was a good game. It should be a, a good sequel. So um, now you're making me feel like I did real bad because you were no. so for mine and now you're so for Matan. No, 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 no. So I didn't know anything about Kirby Air Ride. I had no okay. idea what this game was. So I couldn't like really, okay. you know, like assess what I would think of Matan's pitch. Um, I want, I want you and me to do The Last of Us 3. That's like a different thing. Mm. That's not what we're voting I, on. I still think The Last of Us Part 3 would do the best because I think it's just such a talked about game and such a well-known franchise and such a divisive story at this point that I think it would do extremely I well. I think it would sell the most units, but I think, I agree, but I think that Kirby would sell a lot of units still and do big uh, do well critically. I think it's hard, kind of hard to fuck up. I know, cross my fingers. Um, I, just real quick, I looked up review yeah. scores for Max Gentleman Sexy Business. Uh, 170, mm -hmm. 180, and 190 um, are what I'm seeing. Um, so it seems out like of, it did solid. Yeah. Out of, uh, yeah. Out of 100. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, I mean, it did. It did. It's a great game, but you know, if it's not the kind of game you play, yeah. Right? Like, if you're not into this genre. Um, right? It's indie. And it's, it's not indie, mainstream. yeah. So, yeah. Uh, but, like, relative to the indie market, it would definitely do well. Sure, sure. Um, I think, I think this is between me and I'm not, I don't need it one. to win this yeah. round. <laughs> I think, yeah. I, I'm super into it. I'd be super down for a sequel, but I don't, I think this round is between... Wow, Kirby Air Ride versus Last of Us. Not a, sort of a battle you see I would, I would play the heck out of Kirby Air Ride sequel, but I still got to go with The Last of Us. And I would play the heck out of The Last of Us 3, but I would have to go with Kirby Air Ride. I'm going to have to go with Kirby Air Ride just for I the disagree. the long-term the long-term okay. appeal of the game. Like, I can see this being a game people people play in, like, 10 years. Um, Do rap, people still play Kirby uh, Air Ride? Maybe not 10 years, but I think people played it for a long time. Last of Us 3 is, is now. Okay, mm -hmm. but The Last of Us came out in 2013, and people still play that. Kirby Air Ride came out... Okay, a lot, wait, 2006, I think. A lot yeah. longer, yeah. That's a bit longer. But still, 2016, were people still playing Kirby Air Ride? Um, I don't think so. Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I don't I think mean, so. Um, 2003, I'm sorry, it, 2003. I, oh, wow. It's more the nature of the genre. It's more the nature of the genre. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people played Last of Us once. Um, and a lot of people still play it. Again, that game, I cannot even begin to describe the cultural relevance of that game. Mm -hmm. It's huge. Again, Last of Us and Last of Us 2 are some of my favorite games of all time. Um, but I think that Kirby Air Ride has more replayability. It's yeah, I think it has more replayability, but I don't think that makes it better. Not better. Better is the wrong word. Um, I don't think it makes it, like, 
sell more. I don't know. What I just, I, I do think that Last of Us would sell, would move more units, but I think Kirby Air Ride would move a lot of units and do well critically, which is where I think that Last of Us 3 is going to fail, regardless it's of what so it is. To, I, I, to so me, it's the more solid business investment. Hmm. I don't know. Hmm. I think Last of Us would be a more solid business investment. Even if it doesn't do as well critically, I think fan reviews would do much better than Kirby fan reviews. Maybe. It, Last of Us is more of a diehard game. It's true. Hmm. Like The fans I are mean, more intense about it. Yeah, but the but. thing is, like, with the genre that Kirby Air Ride is in, right, like Mario Kart, Super Smash, whatever, like, these are legacy titles. I think mm -hmm. Kirby Air Ride could be, like, a legacy title. Um, whereas I wouldn't, want, it, I, I wouldn't want to see, a, I wouldn't want to see a Last of Us 4. I would cry if there was no. a Last of Us 4. Yeah, and that's um, why I, I could see part. another Kirby Air Ride. Mm. Yeah, but that's why I have an ending for The Last of Us Part 3 that just, like, ends it. And... So far, Kirby Air Ride has not become that. And so far, The Last of Us is that. I think that's the hope of the sequel, is that the, the sequel will make it what it could have... I don't know. What the series could have been. Let me see. Kirby Air Ride units sold. Wow. Not a ton. Uh, 750,000 in the US and 422,000 in Japan. So that's like a, a million and a quarter, a million and a third. Yeah, I mean, it, it's a lot about the marketing, though. Like, if, yeah. if, if nowadays, if you marketed it like Mario Kart, um, but different and better, you know, you'd get a lot of interest. But I just don't know if Kirby has enough appeal for that. I, think... I don't think it does. If I hadn't have played Kirby Air Ride when I was younger, I would not want to play this game. Uh, that's that's okay. I Kirby. think there are kind of like small children that would be like, OMG, this cute little pink thing. Mm -hmm. um, and would probably play the game. I think Kirby, I agree with you, Caitlin. Kirby does not have the sort of the clout that he once had. But I think Kirby's, I mean, by design, Kirby is accessible and appeals to children. Um, so again, like I think that this kind of hits both sides in that way. And I think that's why that would be where my vote goes. I don't know. I still disagree, but both of uh, you say that sure. one. So, um, so that that's it. I mean, reboot. We've got Stardew Valley. Do you have a subtitle for your reboot? Does it have a? I no, I don't. Oh my god! Don't pressure me like this. A cur uh, Stardew Valley, uh, uh, Two. the war, the Great War. <laughs> the Great War. The Great God. War. Um, it's a terrible title. Yeah. Um, um, mine is Kirby Air Ride 2 Electric Boogaloo. <laughs> Kirby Air Ride 2 Redux. Kirby Air Ride 2 uh, um, uh, Kirby Air Ride 2. There it is. Kirby Air Ride yeah. 2. Kirby Air Ride 2 and Stardew Valley 2 yep. because okay. we can't yeah. think of names. All right. Yeah. Well, that just about does it for this week. Thank you so much for tuning in. You can find us on any anywhere you get your podcasts or on YouTube with a video component. Uh, follow us on our socials. They're linked in the description. Uh, you can find our Patreon as well. Donate to us to help us make more of this content. Uh, and we will see you next um, week. If you liked my pitch at Neil Druckmann, get me to work at Naughty Dog. Um, <laughs> I'll develop it more. Again, I developed this in like a week, even though I had the idea for like two months. I still only developed it in a week. Um, I'll make it so much better. Love me. Let me make Last of Us Part 3 and fix Ellie and make me love the series again. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Bye. Yeah, no, let's, let's flood Naughty Dog because the three yeah. of us are graduating film students with, with proficiency in narrative writing. We can do it. Let's do it. Again, this um, is like a first draft pitch i mean it's not even a pitch level this is just a first draft of uh, outline obviously it can be a lot better i can make it a lot better I, it's okay I, caitlin um, okay. neil neil cuckman get rid of the big arms women don't have big arms okay. uh let us know in the comments tiny and have tiny arms and she can't lift anything mm -hmm. Let us know in the comments, add us, mention us, tweet at us, uh, what reboot or sequel you want to see. Give us yeah. your ideas or just vote for which one of ours you think should have won. Uh, let us know. Ideas to us. Tell everyone how my sequel should have won. Yeah. Okay, Caitlin. <laughs> Great okay, Caitlin. I'm bitter. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you everybody for tuning in. We'll see you next Friday. Bye.